Welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Ricky Rivez here today, who is uh, the Lawrence King Professor at NYU Law School, uh, Dean Emeritus. He is one of the leading voices on regulatory issues. Uh, my good friend Cass Sunstein says, well, we better find out what Ricky thinks all the time when I ask him questions. Uh, he's published eight books and 60 articles uh, in major law reviews and journals. A uh, lot of work on uh, the cost-benefit analysis, the allocation of regulatory responsibility in a federal system, uh, and the design of liability re uh, regimes. Uh, and he's set up a very influential center. Uh, I, I always get the name wrong, but the Institute for Policy Integrity. Okay, well, we believe in integrity here, too. So, all right, please join me in welcoming Ricky. Thank you, Michael. It's, it's, it's great to be here. And if integrity is a good name for a center, Epic is a very good name also. So, um, so you guys are definitely on to something. And, um, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. So I'm going to talk about this book, uh, which was uh, published a little bit a couple months ago, uh, which I co-authored with uh, Jack Linke, who's a former student of mine, is now one of the uh, senior attorneys at, uh, at Policy Integrity. Uh, one of the nice things about policy integrity is you don't need to be there very long to be a senior attorney. Uh, in fact, we don't have any junior ones. So um, I, I, I'll do four things um, today. Um, I'll talk about some about the theory uh, behind the book. And, um, and the theory behind the book uh, involves the following issue. Uh, in regulatory policy uh, decisions in general, and under the Clean Air Act in particular, um, we've made a standard mistake. And the standard mistake has been to um, come up with stringent new source standards and very permissive transition rules that allow existing actors to continue operating without meeting those standards. Um, so I'll talk about the theory of that for a while. Then I will apply that uh, to the case of the Clean Air Act, uh, which is what most of the book is about. The third thing is I'll talk about the connection between those two topics and current discussions about the so-called war on coal, which is an um, um, influential label uh, that is used to um, uh, criticize the work of the Obama administration. Um, and then I'll end by talking about how, despite this very clear and serious problem, uh, which is pretty easy to uh, understand, um, we have not learned from our mistakes and are always seem to be on the verge uh, of repeating them. So I will end on a somewhat uh, um, depressing note. Sorry about that. Um, so standard practice. So this is not um, a new thing. Um, when um, in regulatory policy situations, when we decide to regulate something, we typically focus on what to do about new actors. Um, and we've typically exempted existing actors uh, from those regulations. That's been the standard uh, approach in the US. It's certainly been the standard approach in the Clean Air Act. And there are three separate ideas uh, that uh, explain this or purport to explain this. Uh, one is that it costs more to retrofit an existing source uh, in light of new standards than it would cost to build a new source um, that is being planned once those standards have been identified. Uh, the second is, well, the problem is going to go away. A lot of these existing sources won't exist much longer, so why worry about something that might be difficult? that won't be with us for very long. And the third is an interest group story that we basically need to buy off the opposition. And if we can only exempt the existing actors, they won't complain too much and we'll be able to uh, impose these nice good standards um, on, 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 on good actors. It turns out that from a social welfare perspective, this is a, a, the standard practice is a bad idea and that the interest group analysis is wrong as well. Um, and here, I mean, one of the interesting things about this is that it's not a situation in which the sort of academic literature got it right uh, 
and these uh, policymakers just didn't follow the great advice they get from, uh, from um, academics. In fact, the academic literature, for the most part, has gotten it wrong. Um, the, the, the standard approach in the academic literature, um, mostly in the law and economics literature of regulation, has been to basically uh, look at the problem of new sources and transition rules sequentially. So you first basically ask, what's the optimal um, standard for new sources? And essentially assume there are no existing sources out there. So you sort of look at you know, what are the, the costs of building new sources in light of different possible um, uh, regulatory uh, requirements might be, and you look at what the benefits of various stringencies of regulation might be, and you, um, you pick uh, the optimal uh, level of regulation. And once you've done that, you turn around and say, well, now that we have this new source standard, what's the optimal transition rule? At that point, you need a transition rule because um, as I said, the costs are going to be higher uh, to retrofit the existing, uh, the existing plan. And if you've set a, uh, a very stringent new source standard, you will then need a very generous transition rule. Um, and that follows from um, doing this sequentially. Now, what's the problem with this? If you end up with a very stringent new source standard um, and a very generous transition rule, you might end up with no new sources at all, and you will have created a very significant incentive for the existing sources to continue operating much longer than they otherwise would have. And the reason is that when we talk about the life expectancy of, of a source, of an actor, of a polluter, it doesn't mean that at the end of that life expectancy, the thing would just sort of like vaporize and disappear, and that's what you know, it's useful life means. So, you know, we thought in 1970 that power plants had a useful life of 30 years. So you had like a 25-year-old power plant in 1970. It didn't mean that five years later it was just going to like disappear uh, from the face of the earth. What it did mean is that the expectation was that five years later it was no longer going to be economically desirable to continue operating it because old sources tend to be um, inefficient. They produce products less efficiently. Um, and so what it means is that we expected it to, at that point, be cheaper to have this existing source closed down and be uh, replaced by, by a new source. This is a standard issue. All of us, you know, most of us face it in our daily lives. You know, I have a car that's 13 years old, and every year it costs more to service it. And some year I'm going to decide that it just costs too much and I'm going to buy a new car. It doesn't mean that I couldn't, in theory, continue driving my old car. It just means that I have made an economic decision not to drive it any longer. Now, what happens when, um, what happens to the life expectancy of an existing plant when you come up with a new source standard that's more stringent than the standard that was around before. I mean, if it was an unregulated market, there would have been no standard in, in, in effect before, now there's going to be a stringent standard. Well, if you're going to add sort of a $100 million cost to like buy a scrubber uh, for the new plant and are going to impose no cost at all on the existing plant, suddenly you will have increased the useful life of the existing plant because the existing plant is now going to be able to tolerate lots of inefficiencies, not to have to... Um, um, bear uh, the $100 million cost of the scrubber that would attach if, it built, if, if a new plant was built. So we've extended the useful life of the plant. Uh, so the existing plant is going to actually be around longer. And what about the new plant? Well, the new plant, unless there is an increase of demand for the product, the new plant won't actually come into being because there won't be demand for the new plant. Um, and so one could end up in a situation in which by, as a result of the very stringent um, new source standard and the very lax transition rule, we end up with existing sources operating much longer than they otherwise would have and a significantly decreased demand uh, for new sources. There is a solution to this problem, and that's explored in some academic papers that are the basis for the book. I mean, this, you know, the, the, the hard work isn't done in the book itself. And the solution is to basically optimize uh, 
the new source standard and the transition rule uh, jointly as opposed to doing it sequentially. Um, and you can, you know, see why that would be the case. Uh, because the desirability of a new source standard depends in part on the incentives it creates uh, for um, the transition from existing sources to new sources. So um, the academic literature had gotten it wrong, and the policymakers got it wrong as well, roughly in the same way as the academic literature. Now, what about the interest group analysis? Um, well, the interest group analysis um, is also um, not persuasive because the problem is that once you've bribed the existing sources um, not to oppose a new source standards by getting this transition rule, you've given them a great way to organize around the protection of this benefit they've gotten. And they will now um, be have a huge incentive to try to extend the grandfathering, whatever it is, uh, in scope uh, and over time. Um, and um, and interest groups that might not have existed for this particular purpose now have uh, sort of a homogeneous issue around which to organize, which is the protection and expansion of the grandfathering of the generous transition. So that's sort of the basic insight. Um, so the second thing I want to talk to you about is how this worked itself out um, in the Clean Air Act. So the Clean Air Act of 1970 um, imposes federal standards on um, new sources. And these are federal standards for conventional pollutants. This is before the era of greenhouse gases, before the area of toxic pollutants, for those of you who follow the nuances of the Clean Air Act. So these are the kind of pollutants that affect uh, local public health, um, um, the things that become um, um, the, the, the things that become smog. Um, and um, so, you know, we were, so the, the Clean Air Act imposes new source performance standards on sulfur, dio on sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. Um, and, uh, and the reason for that is to avoid uh, soot and smog. Um, there are no comparable requirements, federal requirements for existing sources. Um, existing sources are left in the hands of states that uh, have to, in theory, come up with state implementation plans that uh, have to be designed to meet uh, health-based federal standards that are imposed as part of the Clean Air Act of, of 1970. If you look at the legislative history and sort of the contemporaneous discussions, um, a lot of it focused on power plants, which is interesting because all of our current um, uh, focus in this area is on power plants because they're very significant sources of emissions. Um, and the discussion was about how these power plants, many of these power plants were approaching the end of this sort of roughly 30-year useful life that was attributed to them in 1970, and, um, and therefore we shouldn't worry about them. Um, but as I indicated, uh, once the new plants had to spend huge amounts of money to install scrubbers, uh, the existing plants uh, continued operating uh, far longer than would otherwise have been the case. Now, you might think, well, but the state standard should have um, solved this problem uh, because otherwise uh, the states wouldn't have been able to meet the national amateur quality standard. Now, it turns out that didn't happen, and it didn't happen for two reasons. First, enforcement of state compliance with these requirements was quite lax. I mean, in fact, in, in 1970, Congress thought that uh, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards would be met by 1975 nationwide. And for those of you who follow that, now that we're in 2016, vast swaths of the country haven't yet met them. Now, some of those standards have, in fact, become more stringent. But nonetheless, um, there would be non-attainment problems even with the original standards. Um, the other problem, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, the, the strange part of this social norm, Michael, is that um, when I've given papers at this university before, usually the first question came before I got to say anything. So, uh, so I got to talk for 10 minutes, so it seemed weird. <laughs>
Okay. Yes. Because I haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> yes, but the, so the, the the no. Yes, it was um, the Clean Air Act is probably uh, our nation's most successful environmental law. It's certainly our nation's most successful environmental law, and in fact. When cost-benefit analysis of regulation are done, if you basically aggregate all cost-benefit analysis of all environmental regulation, it looks wildly positive, and it mostly looks wildly positive as a Clean Air Act, and it mostly looks wildly positive because of the regulation of particular emissions under the Clean Air Act, which saves lots of lives, and those things um, drive basically everything else. I'm not arguing in any way the Clean Air Act was uh, undesirable. It was hugely desirable. But the Clean Air Act contains a tragic flaw. And that tragic flaw, um, and we've been trying to get out of the consequences of that tragic flaw for 45 years and have not yet figured out how to do that. And this extensive grandfathering is the tragic flaw uh, of the Clean Air Act. And, uh, and a lot of what follows, and a lot of the con contemporary debates we are, um, we are facing uh, can be traced back to that tragic flaw. Yes. Yes, that's a good thing. Yes. Right. Okay, so I'll give you more of my talk uh, in response to your question. The, um, this is a 45-year-old flaw, dates back, or 46-year-old flaw, dates back to 1970. For the last 25 years, we've been trying to get out of it. Um, by 1990, we recognized the problem. And, uh, and the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990 and the uh, uh, software outside trading markets um, were the first attempt to do that. Um, the interstate transport rules, the good neighbor provisions, were another way to do that. Uh, the um, regulation of uh, the toxic emissions of, um, of power plants were another way to do that. And, uh, and finally, the regulation of the greenhouse gas emissions of power plants are yet another way to do that. I mean, part of what uh, the book builds up to is to show how the main rules of the Obama administration in this area, which are um, the transport rule, the good neighbor provision of the Clean Air Act. Now, for those of you who aren't aficionados of this thing, I'll, I'll say more about it in a few minutes. The regulation of the hazardous air pollutants uh, of power plants, which is a regulation that was ultimately challenged uh, in the Supreme Court in Michigan versus EPA last term. The Supreme Court um, remanded it. It's now uh, before EPA again. And as of April 15th, as of last week, EPA came up with uh, a new justification for that rule, which is now being challenged again in the courts. Uh, and finally, the, um, the Clean Power Plan, the effort to regulate the greenhouse gas emissions of existing power plants. So those are the three. Obama administration rules that are normally referred to as part of this administration's war on coal. The reason war on coal is in quotation marks in the title is because what is the book shows that each of these regulations has antecedents going back into the 1990s and going back to administrations of both parties. Because basically, since 1990, we've recognized the problem and have tried very hard and with mixed success to correct it. So now you've got the executive summary. Now I'll, you know, but please feel free to interrupt me. At, you know, I mean, this is great. So basically, um, as I already indicated, um, We created this problem in 1970. Let me give you some examples of what this problem has meant. So, um, so one of the ways that the states actually um, try to react to the requirements of the Clean Air Act in 1970 was by externalizing their pollution. Uh, so, because they had to meet the national ambient quality standards in their states, um, one way they could do that 
more effectively is by sending pollution from their states to other states. Um, and the easy way to do that was to create incentives to build taller stacks. And, and the number of tall stacks, these are stacks above 500 feet and above 1,000 feet, uh, constructed after 1970 grew enormously. Um, this is like a great research assistant. I sort of asked him to do this, and he actually came back with the numbers of like the heights of the stacks. Um, so, so now pollution could travel further. Um, most of the problem, um, most of the inability of the northeastern states to meet the national air quality standards now is traced to power plants in the Midwest. And it's traced to power plants in the Midwest that were existing power plants back in 1970. Um, so, and we've been trying to deal with this issue for a long time. In fact, in 1970, there was no way to deal with this issue because there were no provisions in the Clean Air Act designed to control the interstate transport of pollution. In 1977, Congress amended the statute to provide for such provisions, and, and there was now a statutory um, means of doing that. But for a number of reasons, uh, that uh, statutory provision was not implemented in any serious way until the mid-1990s uh, by the Clinton administration. And then, once it was put in place and a number of these good neighbor rules um, uh, began being promulgated, both by the Clinton administration and the administration of George W. Bush, uh, the D.C. Circuit began striking them down. And, um, and the D.C. Circuit eventually struck down the Obama administration's rule in this area, and the Supreme Court finally upheld that rule in 2014. So basically, it took until 2014 to have the effort to control interstate pollution on a, um, on, um, a strong legal footing. And even now, there are skirmishes that are taking place around how to implement uh, the Supreme Court's decision. When the regulatory impact analysis was done on this transport rule of the Obama administration, the prediction was that that rule avoided 10,000 premature deaths per year. Um, so it had quantified uh, benefits of around $90 billion a year. So there's a 10,000 deaths at $9 million a life. The costs were roughly $10 billion. This was actually a hugely uh, beneficial rule. So you might think, well, this is great news. Uh, as of 2014, we actually have a mechanism uh, on clear legal footing for avoiding uh, 10,000 premature deaths a year. Now, significant proportion of these 10,000 premature deaths are caused by these existing power plants that were existing power plants in 1970. And so you can do some rough math and get a sense of what different position we would have been in if those power plants in fact had closed at the end of the useful life they had in 1970. The problem is by this having this bifurcated um, regulatory regime, we significantly extended their useful lives and in fact, a number of these plants are now basically onto their third so-called useful life. I mean, they were like 25 years old in 1970. Um, we're 45 years later, they are in their 70s. I mean, they're like senior citizen power plants uh, past the sort of second 30-year 30, 30 useful life. So this gives you a sense of, you know, what the consequences were. And these were incentives that came straight out of the grandfathering. And again, as I said, to Michael, I mean, this doesn't mean that the Clean Air Act caused these deaths. The Clean Air Act saved huge numbers of lives. That's why it has such high net benefits. But these lives, the ones I just was alluding to, were left on the table. And it didn't have to be uh, that way. OK. You shouldn't take the 10,000 number as, um, you shouldn't just take the 10,000 number and, and multiply by the number of years and end up with like, you know, uh, half a million lives or something like that. Um, 
But you should take the 10,000 number seriously and think, I mean, as the book does, of what the alternatives would have been. If these plants had closed down, they would have been, in all likelihood, depending on the year when they would have closed down, they've either been replaced by more efficient coal plants uh, that produce electricity more efficiently, and whatever that efficiency percentage is, is less pollution. Uh, so, for example, for greenhouse gases, um, that proportion is roughly 20%. I think, on average, uh, these very old power plants produce 20% um, uh, more greenhouse gases than, um, well, 20 to 30% more greenhouse gases than uh, plants built uh, subsequently. And if they have been replaced by natural gas, um, the uh, percentage reduction depends on the on the pollutant, uh, depends significantly on the pollutant. And uh, but what, for any pollutant, uh, there would have been um, there would have been a lot fewer deaths associated with that. So we can't actually. The book doesn't attempt that calculation because to attempt that calculation. You would, you would have to figure out when those plants would have closed down and what the replacement plant at that time would have been. You know, we don't do that. That's a good project for someone to do. You could then calculate what this number is. Um, and Right, and I think to do that, you have to uh, have some model that uh, estimates when these plants would have closed down, because then you can figure out what they would have been replaced by. Right. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> tell me more about why you think that it's only compliance costs. Yeah, that wouldn't have happened. I mean, I don't think any state has regulated new plants more stringently um, than, um, th than EPA required them to, at least has not been a – okay. Michael, we're talking about different kinds of standards. So, the, so let's separate the standards. There are national ambient air quality standards that are set that have to be met everywhere and are not being met everywhere, are not being met anywhere, basically. And then there are emission standards. Yes. Okay. I don't disagree that there have been tremendous improvements. Uh, the fact remains that big chunks of the country have not met the national ambient air quality standards for at least one pollutant. Uh, in fact, probably most of the geographic area of the country hasn't met the national ambient air quality standards for at least one pollutant. But so, so that's one type of standard. The second type of standard are the new source performance standards that apply to new sources. Well, th that's not right either because in, in areas that actually meet the national ambient air quality standards, new sources still have to comply with new source performance standards and can get an exemption from them just because they're not necessary to meet the national ambient air quality standards in that jurisdiction. So basically, both are real standards. 
Now, the new source performance standards are generally met by new sources, because at least ex ante they have to be met, otherwise they won't get permits. Uh, the national amateur quality standards, um, in theory, have to be met, but in practice have not been met. And, and there's nothing, you know, it is true, for example. I mean, what you say is, is, is true. So, for example, a northeastern state could meet the national ambulatory quality standards despite the significant transport of Midwestern pollution from these existing power plants. But to do that, for a state of Connecticut to meet the national ambulatory quality standards for all air pollutants, at, um, it would essentially have to close down its industry and curtail enormously the use of cars. Uh, because for some pollutants during some times of the year, 70% of the pollution comes from out of state. So there's, well, there's, as a practical matter, nothing that can be done. Now, it formally, you're right, it's just a question of regulatory costs. Connecticut could impose a lot of costs on, it, on its economy and could meet these standards. But on the other hand, the, um, any sort of cost-minimizing approach to meeting these standards nationwide would put a lot of the uh, a lot of the costs on the existing plants because by not having reduced their pollution, they can reduce it more cheaply than places that have already been tightly controlled. So that they what? Okay. I, I, I don't think we've disagreed on anything other than, um, um, you know, I, I don't think we disagree on anything. I mean, um, so, so, so I think I gave you a sense. Again, you know, the, the book doesn't actually attempt to quantify uh, the number of lives. I mean, I think it suggests that it's actually a pretty high number. Um, and it explains why the sort of this grandfathering problem turned out to be a very difficult uh, problem to meet in connection with um, with um, lo pollutants that have local health consequences. G let me give you sort of a brief sense about uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, so as I indicated, um, newer um, coal plants. Uh, oh, sorry. Do I keep like. I'll take it. Okay. Yeah. Just take it away. <laughs> uh, newer. Um, uh, power plants emit, uh, newer coal plants emit roughly 20% uh, less uh, greenhouse gases than these old coal plants. And natural gas plants um, emit roughly 50% less. Um, so when you think about um, what the Clean Power Plan, uh, which is the, this administration's regulation for reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of power plants does, is the goal is a 32% reduction by 2030 off 2005 levels. Um, I think as of today, before the Clean Power Plan has gone into effect, we're already 18% down. So we're sort of a significant part of the way there. Um, now again, you can do some back of the envelope calculation. Um, and again, this regulation applies only to, po to power plants. So if you think that all these existing power plants would have closed down by now, that is that the ones that had 30 year life expectancies in 1970 would have closed down 45 years later, uh, if they had been replaced by natural gas plants, which they would have been depending on exactly what year they would have closed down, it would have been half the greenhouse gas emissions. They have been replaced by uh, other coal plants that would have been roughly 20% less. You can see that a lot of um, where we're trying to get with a clean power plan by 2030, we would have actually gotten to already. Um, and in some sense, a clean power plan wouldn't have been necessary. We've been talking about something else. The other thing that I think, you know, that, um, that case studies of the failure of uh, the effort by Congress to regulate greenhouse gas emissions through the uh, Waxman-Markey bill, uh, a lot of the reason that, um, that in the end, um, there are many reasons why the bill didn't go through, but one of the reasons was that basically the existing plants um, push very strongly uh, to get um, free allocations of permits, to basically get grandfathered permits. Um, and, um, and at the end of the day, um, 
to buy them off. Lots of permits were distributed that way. That created a somewhat cumbersome system. It basically created other opposition because a lot of the permits were then given to coal companies. The oil companies were hurt by this and so on. Um, again, it, it's impossible to predict uh, whether Waxman Markey would have passed if a lot of these old power plants would have closed down by then. But it is actually possible to predict that the interest group's dy dynamics uh, would, have been, uh, would have been different. Now, you know, the Clean Air Act wasn't um, totally blind to this problem. And in fact, I mean, I talked about new source standards. In fact, the statute refers to uh, new sources and modifications. So Congress actually had some sense that at some point these plants would get modified. And once they were modified, whatever that means, um, the new source standards would actually attach. Now, modification is defined in the statute to involve two things. It has to be a physical change that increases emissions. And, you know, I tell my students that, you know, they all know what physical change and increase means before they come to law school. But once they show up in law school, uh, after they study this a little bit, they have no clue what any of this stuff means. And, uh, and the more you actually work in this area, the less you know about it because, um, decades after the, this provision is in place, there is still like lots of litigation. So one thing we, that happened very quickly is that the agency uh, promulgated a rule saying that routine maintenance is not a physical change. So for example, if like a screw breaks in your big plant, you can actually replace a screw. That would be like routine maintenance that doesn't trigger the new standards. Now how far you can go um, is um, is not clear. And so these existing plants had an enormous incentive to push the limits uh, of how far they could go, and they did it through a number of different ways. I mean, one was by pushing interpretations of routine maintenance. I mean, there are examples of trade associations advising their members that they could undertake things called total life extension projects, which essentially involved building new sources within the shells of existing sources without triggering the standards. Uh, they did so by pushing the agency to change the regulations. And so, for example, in the administration of George W. Bush, a number of rules were promulgated, including something called the 20% rule, which said that as long as the cost of the change uh, was less than 20% of the cost of building an entirely new plant, that wouldn't count as a physical change. That would be routine maintenance. And they actually didn't even tell you how many of these 20% things you did. There was no limit on them. So, in fact, you could, in theory, um, do five of them five, in five different periods and, and really build yourself a new plan without triggering uh, the modification provisions. That, uh, that rule actually was struck down by the D.C. Circuit. That was the only one of these regulatory changes that were struck down. And when it was struck down, uh, the administration, the Bush administration indicated it would continue applying that rule as part of its enforcement discretion, even though it couldn't um, enforce that rule. Um, what increase means is not clear at all. So, for example, one of the, these regulatory changes defined the baseline against which increase is measured to be um, the highest two, year, two years out of a 10-year period. So once uh, you were at the sort of high point of economic activity, you could basically um, actually in increase your emissions uh, per unit produced without it counting as an increase for the purpose of the statute. Uh, that was challenged unsuccessfully. Um, so, and then um, there was sort of outright um, sort of violation of the rules. I mean, there were, you know, a number of enforcement actions that were brought during the Clinton administration where it was obvious uh, that the rules, uh, the rules governing what a modification is were being, you know, had been violated. Um, now, I don't want you to hear me suggesting that the solution to this is imposing the new source standards on existing sources. That's actually not what I'm suggesting. Because I already indicated that the costs are different and the different costs should actually, um, should actually um, uh, affect uh, the optimal level of these standards. Um, it's just that there are other things that could have been done. So for example, two years after the Clean, Clean Air Act, uh, the Clean Water Act was enacted. Clean Water Act has its own set of problems. You can write a book about those problems. It doesn't have this problem. Uh, the Clean Water Act imposed federal requirements on new sources. It also imposed federal requirements on existing sources. Not the same standards, less stringent standards. And it actually had a uh, progressively um, 
more, uh, more stringent approach. By, it was enacted in 1972. By 1977, existing sources had to meet a certain existing standard. And by 1983, they had to meet a somewhat more stringent existing st source standard, both of them less stringent than new source standards. So this was a, an approach, a bifurcated approach that was used um, that didn't involve um, grandfathering that was essentially unbounded uh, temporarily. Um, as Michael mentioned, the 1990 Amendments of the Clean Air Act that established this trading provision uh, put existing sources and new sources within the same uh, trading scheme. So existing sources could see, um, ha had an incentive to reduce their emissions or, or to close down if they couldn't reduce their emissions sufficiently cheaply. Uh, and the incentive was caused by, by the price of the permit. Um, you could imagine sunset provisions under, after a certain period of time. So what happens when you have a bifurcated approach like this is that you extend the effective useful life of the existing source. So the existing source actually gets um, a huge benefit. You could imagine a regulatory approach that provides for grandfathering, but only for the useful life at the time that the bifurcated regime is put in place. So the 25-year-old power plant in 1970 that was expected to have a total life expectancy of 30 years, could have gotten five years. And the 20-year-old power plant could have, gotten, could have gotten grandfathering for 10 years. But that at, at the end of some period, um, the new source standards would have kicked in. Or you can imagine a situation in which they get the amortization period for the investment. Or, 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 um, the, but the tragic flaw of the Clean Air Act was that it essentially ended up providing for grandfathering that had no real um, temporal constraint. Um, and, and interest groups figured out ways of uh, pushing the uh, somewhat ambiguous temporal constraint that was essentially reflected by this modification provision uh, in ways that essentially uh, made it um, inoperative. Uh, at least for a long period of time. So that's a tragic flaw. It's been devil us for 45 years. And for the last 25 years, uh, we've been trying to get out of it. And the argument in that part of the book is that we should not regard uh, the, um, these three big Obama administration regulations that are typically uh, presented to be um, the war on coal, um, the president's single-minded effort to destroy uh, uh, coal in America because whatever, um, for whatever reason, um, but rather that it's a process of undoing the harm of unconstrained grandfathering, and it's a harm we actually recognize going back to the late 1980s uh, that was first reflected with the acid rain provisions of uh, the 1990 amendments. And the book then shows how each of these rules, of these three rules, has antecedents in uh, each uh, in in administrations of both parties going back to the 1990s. Uh, different rules have antecedents in different administrations. I mean, unless you're particularly interested in this, I won't like you know give you the whole lineage of them. But you can actually, I think, take my word that that is in fact true. Um, The most controversial of these arguments uh, is around the clean power plant, is around the regulation of the greenhouse gas emissions of power plants. Um, there was no such rule uh, until now. But since 1997, um, we had set in motion a process that was inexorably going to lead in this direction. Because in 1997, uh, the Supreme Court held that uh, greenhouse gases are air pollutants for the purposes of the Clean Air Act. Uh, under the Clean Air Act, air pollutants that endanger public health or welfare have to be regulated. Uh, following the Supreme Court decision, EPA was required to make an endangerment finding, that is to determine whether greenhouse gases actually endanger public health or welfare. That finding was initially made uh, by the Bush uh, EPA administrator, Stephen Johnson. It didn't become operative in the Bush administration because it had to be sent to OIRA, the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs at OMB. Uh, for review under the President's Executive Order on Cost-Benefit Analysis. And OIRA came up with a nifty uh, argument that uh, rules at OIRA are received when the email is open, not when the email is sent. Um, the OIRA administrator was instructed uh, not to open the email. The General Counsel of OMB provided a legal opinion saying that OIRA therefore had not received the email. 
and the 120-day period for the review of, uh, of proposed rules wasn't therefore, um, didn't therefore start to run. And eventually the Bush administration came to an end, and one of the first things that the Obama administration did was to essentially um, put in place uh, an endangerment finding that was very similar to the endangerment finding that the Bush administrator actually had come up with. But this time, uh, the OR administrator, by then Cass Sunstein, opened the email, and, uh, and the rule was, uh, was approved. So now, uh, now we had, uh, by now, it was the case that greenhouse gases were air pollutants. They were air pollutants because the Supreme Court had said so, and they endangered public health because EPA had made that finding, which was basically finding the prior administration as well as a practical matter. Uh, at that point, there were probably non-discretionary duties that the administration had to undertake uh, to regulate greenhouse gases. I mean, the greenhouse gas emissions of cars were already regulated in the early years of the Obama administration, and EPA had been sued uh, for its failure to come up with greenhouse gas emissions for station resources. And the Clean Power Plan um, uh, came into being in part as uh, a consent decree between the administration and these challengers. Now, you know, it's understandable why um, the Obama administration doesn't go out of its way to say, look, you know, we're not doing anything particularly innovative. We're just following a course of action that was started 25 years ago by many administrations. And, um, and um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, president, you know, is operating in a political environment. It says, like, you know, we are like the administration is going to solve this problem. Um, that actually is, to some extent, weakening um, the, um, the um, administration's position in the courts. But the truth of the matter is that each one of these rules continues a 25-year, uh, continues a, a, a pattern that started 25 years ago as we began to try to um, undo the very bad consequences of this tragic flaw in the design of the Clean Air Act. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's right, although I think it is true that the form that the Clean Power Plan took is obviously taking advantage of uh, low gas prices because um, the regulation has to be justified and has to be justified, uh, and one of the statutory requirements is taking costs into account. Whatever, and whatever that means, it means that you have to do something. Um, and, um, and so the percentage reduction requirements might have been quite different if natural gas was much more expensive. So you might have had a clean power plant. It might not have required a 32% decrease from the 2005 baseline by 2030. Uh, in fact, natural gas prices were low before the clean power plan came into being. I mean, in fact, a lot of the prior environmental regulations um, have huge net benefits uh, where a lot of the net benefits are not the direct benefits of that particular rule but are co-benefits that come from the switch from coal to natural gas, which then reduces pollutants that are different from the pollutants the regulation itself is trying to, um, is, is trying to reduce. So that's true for some of the national ambient quality standards. It's true for the regulation of, um, of the toxic emissions uh, of power plants and so on. So it's, um, it is true that it, the clean power plant came into being at a time when natural gas prices were low. Natural gas prices were actually were already low before the clean power plan was put into place. And, um, and you can certainly imagine a different form of a clean power plan uh, with high natural gas prices. It might just have had uh, less, um, less ambitious reduction requirements. Because otherwise the cost would have been too high and it would have violated one of the requirements of, of the statute. Well, look, I mean, we don't know, right? I mean. Um, my best, you know, if you ask me to speculate why the clean power plan was sort of the, the, that regulatory process was begun when it was begun and not earlier, um, I can, you know, I'll give you my hypothesis. It's not part of the book. So my hypothesis is that there was no reason to focus on this stuff when it looked like it was going to be a legislative solution. Legislative solution in principle is better because 
Um, this kind of regulation is done sector by sector. So now we're going to spend like, you know, five years on a regulatory approach dealing with power plants. Now, power plants are an important part of, this, uh, of the greenhouse gas problem. But they're not the only part. So, uh, and, 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 these, and this rule actually isn't sufficient to meet the Paris commitment probably. So what we're going to do next. So next we'll have to like deal with something else. We'll have to, and doing these things sector by sector is, um, is inefficient in part because most people think they can't, under this regulatory approach, it can't be trading across sectors. So you, we, we can probably have trading programs within power plants and when we do the next thing, we might be able to have trading programs within that sector, but we won't be able to uh, trade between power plants and the next sector to be regulated with that, whatever that sector is, whereas a legislative approach could allow very broad trading and so the cost of whatever uh, reduction we want to have are going to be, uh, will be lower. So until 2010, uh, the administration was trying to get a legislative solution and it actually looked, looked reasonable. I mean, it looked like it actually might happen. I mean, it passed the House. Um, uh, remember, when the administration got started down this road, there were 60 Democratic senators. Now, not for very long, because Ted Kennedy died, and then there were only 59. And, um, and there were some, at that point, there were probably some Republicans who were prepared to do it. And then, of course, in um, 2010, uh, a lot of the Democrats lost a lot, a lot of Senate seats. After that loss, and in the run-up to the president's reelection. Almost no regulations. You know, for the year before the president's reelection, very few regulations were enacted. In fact, um, um, you know, Cass Sunstein was quite criticized for the bottling up of regulations at OIRA. The, 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 the time that it took for OIRA to process regulations went up a huge amount and so on. And so uh, the view at the time, we remember we were still recovering from the economic crisis. The view at the time was that regulations in the run-up to the election were toxic for the president's reelection. Um, and that was probably a good political judgment. Um, after the president was reelected, uh, the machinery to put the clean power plan in place actually got started. Um, these things have uh, take a lot of time. You know, for a massive rule of this sort to be put into place, it'll take you know a year or two to propose a rule, and then. The comment period and the promulgation of the final rule take another year. And that has basically taken up most of the president's second term, which is unfortunate because the president will end his second term without the clean power plan being on firm legal footing because the legal challenges will continue into the next administration, which might take a different view about the legality of the clean power plan. So I, you know, if I was making a prediction of why it happened when it happened, uh, this is a story I would tell. Um, and I would also point out that, again, I mean, it's not that um, natural gas prices became low right as the clean power plant was being put into place. They were low before that. And, um, and, but before that, at the time when they were already low, um, but at a time that was after the failure of Waxman-Markey, it was a run-up to the re-election, the president's re-election. So that'd be my story. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the production of power increased a lot since 1970, which is why we have a lot of new sources, uh, even though the existing sources continued operating longer. Um, the yes.
Well, the optimal solution is a function of your estimate of the demand growth, right? I mean, so what do you would – and the way you gather this is, you know, when I started, I said, look, the, the mistake in the academic literature was to approach this optimization problem sequentially, to essentially first look at how to optimize standards for new sources, essentially forgetting about the existence of existing sources, and then asking, well, now that we have the standard for new sources, what is the optimal transition rule for existing sources? Uh, instead, we should do this um, jointly. Uh, and if we do it jointly, um, um, we would do an optimization that, that had um, – that was dependent on, on assumptions about demand growth. No, it is right. I mean, when, when you have, you know, look, so here's the deal. If you, if future demand is large compared to current demand, this problem becomes less important. It doesn't become irrelevant. It becomes less important. If uh, future demand, if you expect demand to be stable over time, no demand growth, then this problem becomes much more serious. Because, if, because now you might really end up with no new plants <laughs> because you have no demand growth and you now are providing incentives for these existing plants to stay on much longer. So I think you're right that the, the, the significance of this problem is a function of expected demand growth. But for any level of expected demand growth, this remains a problem. Yeah. Well, it, it, it matters. It matters less. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> well, I think you're attributing sort of too much learning to what actually happened in 1970. Um, I don't – I mean, I, I, I've talked to the, you know, sort of senior staff people who were around, um, who were like, you know, Muskie's staff. I mean, Senator Muskie was the, the, the person in the Senate who was mostly responsible for the Clean Act of 1970. I, I don't think they understood um, the incentives, you know, being caused by, uh, by the bifurcated system. And there's no reason why they should have understood it. I mean, the academic literature at that time didn't understand it either. Look, I, I understand that's the case, and, you know, it, it, what we might be doing is providing an ex post justification for what they did. I don't think they were focused on those. I mean, I don't think the people who were actually involved in the drafting of the Clean Act of 1970 said, you know, the reason that this makes sense is because the growth assumptions are such that, you know, most of the problem is, you know, the, the, that a few years later, most of the problem is going to be taken care of by the new sources. I think what... I don't think they focused on the incentives that were creating. But they were definitely focused on that. Look, they made a lot of mistakes, and um, and the mistakes are um, understandable. And again, I, and going back to Michael's first question, I'm not in any way suggesting that this was like – you know, unbalance a bad thing. It was a very good thing, unbalanced. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at 
uh, regulatory flaws that were embedded in the structure. And again, the Clean Air Act is not um, is not anomalous. Let me give you sort of one example of how. I mean, I, I said like the fourth part is going to give you a sense of how we're going to replicate how we might sort of be replicating these flaws. I mean, even in this area. So this one is is, is a bullet we just dodged uh, very recently. So. The next regulation go, coming down the pike of green, on the greenhouse gas front is a regulation of methane emissions from uh, oil and gas installations. Uh, the administration has proposed such a rule. Um, the proposed rule applies only to um, new oil and gas installations. Um, even though I think even 10 years from now, the prediction is that 90% 90, 90 of the problem is going to come from existing sources. Now you might think, well, maybe we just can't regulate um, existing oil and gas installations. Well, we know that's not true because around the same time, the Bureau of Land Management came up with a regulation of methane emissions from oil and gas installations on federal lands, which actually includes uh, a regulation of uh, existing facilities. And obviously, if this can be done on federal lands, it can also be done on non-federal lands. Now, this is a bullet we dodge because um, when Prime Minister Trudeau visited the White House um, last month as part of sort of an agreement with Canada involving um, greenhouse gas regulation that um, includes a whole bunch of things, including uh, harmonizing the social cost of carbon across the U.S. and Canada, uh, one of the things that was announced is that both countries would undertake the regulation of uh, methane emissions from um, from existing uh, oil and gas installations. I mean, the administration hasn't proposed such a rule yet, and it's not even clear we'll get to propose such a rule uh, before the president's term ends, but the president is now on record as saying this is a good idea. Uh, as you, if, if you follow this, uh, there's ongoing debate about the regulation of greenhouse gas emissions on airplanes. There's some sort of international agreements around that. The first proposals that were floated by the administration not only exempted existing planes, but exempted the construction of new planes in existing models. Uh, so this created an incentive to continue building, you know, sort of obsolete models, like, you know, more Boeing 737s, because if you built those, uh, you didn't, you know, you wouldn't need to uh, regulate the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it turns out that it, it now, I mean, this whole thing is in somewhat, somewhat of in somewhat of flux, so it now looks like um, we will end up with a system that applies both to new and old planes. Although one concern is that the standards will be so lax that every existing plane will actually meet the standard before the standard is even put in place. But, but the point about you know some of these examples is that it's not like uh, the regulators have like learned this lesson and say, well, whatever we do, we shouldn't have. Um, a bifurcated system that puts no um, um, no constraint on the grandfathering, and yet we seem to be doing that um, uh, even now. And um, yeah. Well, uh, that's a standard story. I think it's not true. I mean, and one of the reasons I think it's not generally true is that, it, for example, wasn't true for the Clean Water Act. And it wasn't that the Clean Water Act regulated the, um, the um, emissions of existing sources because we had learned so much since the passage of the Clean Air Act. The Air Act was passed in 1970. The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. And we had learned absolutely nothing between 1970 and 1972 because no regulations had been promulgated yet. Um, you know, the... Dynamics was different. It was a different committee. There were different people and so on. Um, we certainly contemplate trading schemes that include new and existing sources. We don't typically say, well, if we had a trading scheme, we'd have to immediately exempt the existing sources uh, in order for the thing to happen. We don't say that. And, and a trading scheme that brings new and existing sources together is a good thing because it basically shows um, – shows a price and creates an incentive uh, for the existing sources to do something, either to reduce their emissions or, or to close down um, if they're sufficiently inefficient. Um, the other point that I mean, the, the, the sort of worth underscoring is that a regulator is less likely to fight this if it thinks there are no consequences. Um, and so if it thinks, look, this is actually pretty benign compromise because – 
uh, a lot of the existing sources already are way into, you know, have already been around a long time and the remaining useful life is, isn't that much longer. Well, that is basically not understanding how a bifurcated approach of that sort increases a useful life. And so if a regulator actually was focused on that, um, they might still cut a deal, obviously. It might just be a different deal. Um, and, and the idea that you buy off these interests is not right because one of the things that we've, we actually did, I mean, it, interesting, in 1970, there weren't powerful trade associations as we know them knocking on the halls of Congress. In fact, I mean, it was a very different system. Um, and uh, most of these trade associations that are now big players in this area didn't even exist. Um, the members actually went on a retreat and wrote the legislation themselves with like one staff member each. I mean, this guy Leon Billings, you know, and Muskie like sat together and wrote this thing. And I, I interviewed this guy, this guy's in his 70s. He's incredibly knowledgeable. When one of these cases was argued in the Supreme Court, Justice Breyer asked the lawyer for um, the, the, the coal plants what something meant and the lawyer sort of like gave not a very good answer, and Justice Breyer said, well, you know, if you want to know what this means, what you should go do is go talk to Leon Billings. He was Muskie's chief staff person. The lawyer actually said, you know, understandably, well, I can't really do it right now in the middle of the oral argument in the Supreme Court. So um, it was a different world, and I think we shouldn't actually assume that our current understanding of the sort of interest group dynamics around these big environmental regulations now were the way it was then. I think this was a poorly understood problem. I think it remained a poorly understood problem in the academic literature for a long time. And I think it's bedeviled us. And I mean, again, I'm not naive. I'm not saying that, you know, um, the regulator won't cut deals and won't have to make compromises in order to get things passed. But it, it is a good thing to understand what the consequences are and also to understand that the problem doesn't go, the interest group problem doesn't go away once um, the bifurcated approach is put in place. And you can look at decades of experience under this sort of modification wars under the Clean Air Act to understand why that's uh, why that is so. Yeah, Mark. Well, actually, for the Clean Air Act, it's been fixed at this point. Uh, and it's been fixed for a um, combination of reasons. Um, it was fixed because of the uh, acid rain provisions of the 1990 amendments that put new and existing plants on the same, um, in the same playing field with respect to sulfur dioxide emissions. It was fixed because of the transport rules, which essentially put them on, on, on the same, um, uh, on the same plane with respect to mostly to particulate emissions. Uh, it's been fixed because of the toxic provisions, the hazard air pr provisions of the Clean Air Act, because those provisions actually do apply to existing sources. Um, and, um, and it was fixed because um, of the Clean Power Plan, which, is, which invokes a provision of the Clean Air Act that hasn't been used that frequently. And that's actually one of the arguments uh, in the sort of legal case against it, which is, you know, still um, uh, how that all turns, you know, works out remains to be seen. But but we've now taken kind of a strong position that I mean, the Australian has taken a strong position that that this less used provision of the Clean Air Act allows it to reach the greenhouse gas emissions of existing sources. And then it's been fixed because natural gas prices are so low, and if they remain low long enough. Um, this will stop being a serious problem for the Clean Air Act. Now, I am less confident that it was fixed. Um, so it, when I said it's fixed for the Clean Air Act, I said it, it's been fixed for the Clean Air Act with respect to power plants. It hasn't necessarily... Right. It hasn't necessarily been fixed, for example, with respect to, like, methane emissions from oil and gas, which is the next regulation coming down the pike on, uh, on greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe now um, we're in a slightly better posture uh, after uh, this sort of agreement with Canada, but, you know, we, we haven't seen how this is going to get implemented. The devil is going to be in the details. So I'm more confident that we now have an approach going forward with respect to power plants under the Clean Air Act than I am that we 
sort of have a sufficiently good understanding of the problem that for the next regulatory matter, we will actually look at this correctly. I'm sort of less confident of that. Well, um, for many, um, well, are you talking just generally just Clean Air Act problems or regulatory problems more broadly? Regulators have the authority under the Clean Air Act, um, at least with respect to the pollutants they are currently focused on, um, because um, for any pollutant for which there are no national ambient air quality standards, regulators have the authority to do that. And for pollutants for which there are national ambient air quality standards, we are actually dealing with a lot of the problem now through the enforcement of these good neighbor provisions of the transport rules. So it may be that as a practical matter, uh, we have the tools we need. But again, they have to be invoked. Um, some of these tools, I mean, all of these tools were in the Clean Air Act at least going back to 1990. Some of them were in the Clean Air Act going back to 1970, and some of them were in the Clean Air Act going back to 1977. It wasn't that they weren't there. Uh, they weren't being invoked until um, 1990, and since then it's been a pretty painful process, in part painful in, at times because of of inaction by the administration, in part painful because uh, of challenges in the courts that took a long time to resolve. Yes, it was bipartisan until 1990, basically, um, um, for the Clean Air Act. and. Um, it was very, I mean, so, so there was also this idea that as these problems kept, came up, Congress would fix them. So for example, in 1977, when there was beginning to be an understanding that we had created an incentives for greater transport of pollution across state lines, Congress actually enacted a provision. It turned out not to be effective for a very long time for a combination of reasons, but Congress actually did, did something about it. In 1990, Congress took up the acid rain provisions, which were sort of another manifestation, again, of the sort of interstate transport problem. Since 1990, the Clean Air Act has been unamendable, and I think most people don't think that, at least in the foreseeable future, it's not going to be amended. So we don't have uh, that luxury um, at this point. Um, I mean, we live in a very different world. I mean, when you think about some of the big environmental statutes, the Superfund statute, which is a very significant statute, was enacted um, – in 1980, in the lame duck session, so Jimmy Carter had lost his re-election bid, and the Democrats had lost control of the Senate. And nonetheless, um, Superfund uh, was approved. It would have been very easy to put this whole thing off to 1981 with a Republican Senate and, um, and a Reagan presidency, and that didn't happen. It's unimaginable now. So yes, that is part of the world we live in, where Congress is essentially not a functioning institution for dealing with um, um, regulatory flaws. And the question is, you know, how can agencies deal with statutory they have to, to fix the issue? And again, and, and the plea here is to sort of understand, um, to use the Clean Air Act and the sort of painful history of um, of what, what the book calls this tragic flaw, and then the 25-year uh, effort to actually undo this, now with some success, uh, to understand um, the problems of grandfathering.